You're listening to the HWP Report, bringing you news and information about issues pertaining to health, wellness and performance with your host, Dr. Faiz Kirsten. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this podcast of the Health Wellness Performance Institute. The Institute merges root cause medicine with empowerment programs, thereby helping people to prevent and reverse chronic illness and to optimize their health and wellness. Uh, now, our three-month program focuses largely on assisting patients who have been experiencing ongoing struggles with cancer, autoimmune diseases, and neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's disease and dementia, amongst others. We do, however, also assist patients with other chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension, for example, and who are interested in reversing these conditions. And the Institute also offers various health and wellness products and educational courses. So visit us at the link below uh, to learn more about the Health Wellness Performance Institute. Okay, so before we start today's uh, discussion, and the topic today is actually uh, neurodegenerative disease, uh, what it is and some natural treatments to consider in preventing and reversing this condition. Uh, as I said, before we actually start talking about this condition, and its treatments and in fact we're going to be dividing this podcast into three parts so this is part one but i just want to get back to episode one where we spoke about the subconscious mind and consciousness and i mentioned in episode one that uh, perception is actually the experience that we have of the world that we live in um, you know our awareness of our internal environment and our external environment but the a fuller definition is actually perception is actually an awareness and interpretation of the environment internal and external via feelings and sensations uh, i do explain that though in the report so if you get all of a copy of the report you'll see uh, how i describe perception so okay let's get on to today's discussion which is as i said neurodegenerative disease now you know since we live in a world which compromises virtually everyone's brain function. I'll really start off by asking this question, you know, how do we fix our brains and optimize their functioning? So let's talk about that. All right, let's get into that discussion. So we'll start with something called the BBB. Now I will explain what this means, the triple B, uh, a little later on. So in 1695, there was a, a book with a very long title that was published in London, okay? And the author of the book was Dr. Humphrey Ridley. And this book was the first treatise in the English language on neuroanatomy. Now, the title of the book, as I said, was a long title. The Anatomy of the Brain Containing Its Mechanisms and Physiology Together with Some New Discoveries and Corrections of Ancient and Modern Authors on that subject. Now, <laughs> that's quite a mouthful of a title. Now, in the book, Ridley described his work and he provided the first description of various brain structures, you know, including the BBB. He found that substances which were injected into the bloodstream do not enter the brain. And in fact, Ridley's contributions to neuroscience actually laid the foundation for modern neurosurgery. Now, about 190 years later, in 1885, the German microbiologist, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, injected dyes into the peritoneum of animals. And this was part of his research into dyes and tissue staining. And he found that, in fact, all the organs of the animal were stained when injected the dye into the peritoneum, but except for the brain and spinal cord. And he presumed that this was due to the different binding affinities of different tissues to different dyes. Okay. But Ridley actually had a deeper insight than Ehrlich, you know, into the into this issue, as was reflected in his explanation of the impermeability and the importance of cerebral blood vessels or blood vessels running through the brain. Now, a student of Dr. Ehrlich, or Professor Ehrlich, Edward Goldman. He performed the converse of, of uh, Ehrlich's original dye experiment by actually injecting the dye tryptan blue directly into the CSF of the brain. And in this experiment, Edwin Goldman found that the brain and spinal cord of the animal was stained, but the body of the animal was not. 
SA found the reverse. So Goldman then injected the same dye intravenously uh, into, the, into the bloodstream, and he found no staining in the nervous system aside from the presence of dye in the choroid plexus and the pineal gland. So there's some parts of the brain and spinal cord that basically uh, don't have a BBB, but we'll talk about that now. So what these experiments actually then showed was in fact that uh, the, the experiments clearly demonstrated the existence of a compartmentalization between the brain and the rest of the body, okay? The brain and spinal cord basically. So the existence of a physical barrier between the blood in the blood vessels in the brain and the brain tissue itself was actually first hypothesized by someone known as Max Lewandowski in a publication in 1900. And in these experiments, Lewandowski injected certain chemicals into the blood and found that they had no pharmacological effect on the nervous system whereas symptoms did occur after injection directly into the ventricles of the brain. So Lewandowski concluded that the walls of the cerebral capillaries hinder the transit of certain compounds and allow the transit of other compounds. Okay. Um, so he subsequently termed this, coined this term blood-brain barrier. Okay, so that's what BBB stands for. It stands for blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier then is actually a highly selective uh, semi-permeable semi border that separates the circulating blood uh, from the brain and extracellular fluids in the central nervous system. Okay, And it's actually formed by endothelial cells of the capillary wall. So these tiny, smallest blood vessels called capillaries, and the endothelial cells, are cells that line them, uh, they form the blood-brain barrier together with astrocytes, thin feet, and pericytes. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. It's better to see it on a diagram. But uh, there's three components that make up the blood-brain barrier, okay? So one of them is the endothelial cells that line the capillary walls, then the astrocytes, thin feet, which in sheet on the outside of the capillary, and then there's pericytes embedded in the capillary basement membrane. Those three elements form the blood-brain barrier. So they prevent certain substances from getting into the brain from the blood, and they allow other substances in, into the brain, and, and vice versa. So, so why, is, why am I emphasizing or putting all this emphasis on the blood-brain barrier? The reason for this is that because if it doesn't work properly, it becomes leaky, okay? It becomes hyperpermeable. Uh, resulting in the brain in brain dysfunction and neurodegeneration. So the blood-brain barrier has a critical role in protecting the brain and also the body too. So in fact, the prerequisite for every degenerative condition of the brain is in fact a breach of the blood-brain barrier. And brain degeneration cannot occur if the blood-brain barrier is intact. So this is a very important point that if your blood-brain barrier is intact, you can't get any of these neurodegenerative diseases. And we'll, we'll mention you know, what some of them are. So what exactly then does, it, does the blood-brain barrier do? Basically, it allows the passage of some molecules through it by passive diffusion, and then it also allows the transport of certain molecules by active transport across, across the membrane, okay? Across the blood-brain barrier. And some, and some of the molecules that it allows by active transport or to cross it is glucose, water, and amino acids. And these obviously are crucial to neural function. So there are some certain specialized structures which participate in sensory and secretory integration within the neural circuits. And these are the circumventricular organs and the choroid plexus, which actually don't have a blood-brain barrier. Okay? Some parts, as I mentioned early on, but we're not going to focus on that for the purpose of this podcast. Okay, so the blood-brain barrier then also restricts the passage of pathogens, which is infectious agents, bacteria, viruses, and so forth. Uh, restricts the diffusion of solutes in the blood and larger hydrophilic molecules uh, from entering the cerebrospinal fluid, right? while allowing, allows the diffusion of hydrophobic molecules such as oxygen, carbon dioxide and hormones and small polar molecules. So it restricts the passage of certain 
filaments and pathogens, like we said, solids in the blood and large hydrophilic molecules, and getting into the cerebrospinal fluid while it allows the diffusion of other molecules, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones, and small polar molecules. So now we must talk about leaky brain. What is leaky brain? We talk about leaky gut a little while later. But what is leaky brain? Now, I'm going to quote Dr. Walter H. Backus from Maastricht University Medical Center. He said, blood-brain barrier leakage means that the brain has lost its protective means. The stability of brain cells is disrupted, and the environment in which nerve cells interact becomes ill-conditioned. These mechanisms could eventually lead to dysfunction in the brain. It also obviously leads to the death of brain cells too. So in other words, it leads to neurodegeneration. So what then is NDD or neurodegenerative disease? It's really a disease resulting from the progressive loss of structure or function of neurons, of nerves, nerve cells, including the death of these nerve cells or neurons. Um, so, and glial cell activation and the resulting inflammation also plays a role in the death of nerve cells, okay? Whenever anything is causing or triggering uh, the death of nerve cells and glial cells are also activated. Okay, so the, the NDD or neurodegenerative disease includes diseases such as Alzheimer's, dementia, other dementias, uh, something called another disease called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis (ALS), Lewy body disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, spinal muscular atrophy and, and quite a few others also okay and neurodegenerative disease can actually occur at any age right it's not just old people that get NDD but uh, it can occur at any age and in fact it's been said that it's become more common than cancer and cardiovascular disease in fact it's extremely common and, and we'll see why neurodegenerative disease is actually so common these days because uh, if you look at the causes, then you'll realize why it's so common. And, and so we all, so the question then, what causes NDD? Many factors actually cause and contribute to NDD. Uh, environmental stresses, leaky gut, genetic weaknesses of the blood-brain barrier, and so forth. And genetic inheritance actually creates vulnerability to NDD and autoimmune disease. But it actually requires triggering factors for the genes to be expressed. So if you have a genetic propensity, to have a weakened blood-brain barrier, uh, you won't actually have the consequences of that or won't develop a neurodegenerative disease if you're not exposed to triggering factors, okay? So in the absence of triggering factors, the disease may not develop, all right? But if you're exposed to triggering, even if you don't have a genetic inherent uh, propensity, uh, but you're exposed to triggering factors, then, you know, you have a high probability of getting a uh, leaky brain. Okay, we just have to talk a little bit about leaky gut, okay, which is also known as intestinal hyperpermeability. This is a very common condition. Um, a leaky gut actually affects the whole body, okay, so it doesn't just affect the gut, okay, the consequences are felt throughout the body. So there's various factors such as toxins in the food, antibiotics, chlorine in the drinking water, industrial meat, you know, meat that comes from factory farms, animals. Uh, produced in these horrible factory farms. Processed food and drinks and other poor dietary substances will actually decimate the good or the beneficial bacteria in the gut and then allow the pathogenic species to thrive. Okay, so dysbiosis actually refers to the overgrowth of bad bacteria and other microorganisms in the, in the gut. And the harmful microorganisms that basically overgrow in a situation of dysbiosis, where your good bacteria are destroyed by those factors that we mentioned, the harmful bacteria include things like uh, bacteria such as Staphylococci, Streptococci, Bacilli, Clostridia, Candida albicans, Enterobacteria, and other parasites, for example. And then the outcome of this assault is damage to the intestinal wall and the appearance of gaps in the gut lining and then the leaking, once you have these gaps, the leaking of substances and microorganisms through the gut wall. And these would not normally be allowed through, of course, okay? But now because these gaps that have appeared, they go through, and then they cause a problem, okay? And we'll discuss that now. 
but this condition as i said is known as intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut syndrome so when the gut is leaky, large food particles and all these other things like we mentioned, yeast, bacteria, environmental toxins, they cross the intestinal wall and they enter the bloodstream and then they travel to various parts of the body and such as the joints, the brain, the liver, other major organs and so forth. So we said le leaky gut affects the whole body, so we see why. Uh, and then the immune system reacts to these foreign agents in the tissues by creating an inflammatory response in these areas. So if it occurs in the joints, you can get arthritis, uh, autoimmune disease known as rheumatoid arthritis, and so forth. Now, due to the continued opening in the gut lining, the toxins and other foreign agents continue to pour into the bloodstream and they lodge in the body and an inflammatory process in the tissues does not settle down. In other words, this inflammation becomes chronic because uh, the continued exposure to all these damaging agents causing the, the, the gaps to appear in the gut wall, uh, they cause then these agents, these toxic agents, to continuously sleep into the bloodstream, get to the tissues and organs, and cause consistent or continuous ongoing inflammation known as chronic inflammation. And then this destroys the tissues and organs and rapidly ages the body. Now, some of the triggers that we mentioned some of the triggers causing intestinal damage leading to leaky gut. We'll just mention some of them again. And things like dietary protein, including gluten, is a very big one, which we'll talk a bit about now. Toxins and chemicals in the food, heavy metals, low hydrochloric acid in the stomach and digestive enzymes, antibiotics, food sensitivities, um, gut infections, imbalancing between the normal uh, the good and bad bacteria, chronic psychological stress, even pregnancy can cause leaky gut, blood sugar issues, and so forth. So we must understand that there's a relationship between the brain and the digestive system, okay? So whatever happens in the gut has a direct impact on brain function, okay? Something known as gut and psychology syndrome, GAPS. A study was done in 2014 uh, and was published or study was rather it was actually published in 2014 in the advances in experimental medicine and biology journal and it study indicated clearly demonstrated the relationship between changes in the gut flora the gut bacteria and brain function okay so there's a direct relationship between the bacteria in your gut the balance between good and bad and how your brain functions okay now, the small intestine and the stomach are aligned with these epithelial cells that are connected together by tight junctions, okay? Similar to the epithelial cells in the blood-brain barrier those we mentioned earlier on, and they also basically connected together by tight junctions, okay? And then these tight junctions prevent particles that are not supposed to enter the bloodstream from the gut or enter the brain from the blood, the capillary, the blood in the capillaries, uh, and these tight junctions basically only allow essential nutrients in, like we mentioned earlier, okay, and substances, prevents others from getting in, which shouldn't be getting in, okay. So we mentioned all these uh, factors, uh, such as stress, infection, gut flora changes, poor diet, and so forth, um, which basically causes the gut to become permeable and not to work properly. Okay, and then basically cause our gut to become uh, lining, to become inflamed and leaky. Now, very important, which I mentioned earlier on, uh, substance, toxin actually, uh, is gluten. Okay, uh, gluten can also cause the tight junction to become more permeable, making the intestinal barrier and the blood brain barrier actually weak. And in fact, a, a study published in 2011 in the Physiological Review Journal stated that zonulin is the only substance that regulates the function of the tight junctions in the blood-brain barrier of the brain and the intestinal barrier of the gut. Zonulin, very, very important substance to be aware of. Um, and another study published in 2006 in the Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology found that gliadin, which is a protein present in wheat and gluten, actually increases zonulin, right? So when a zonulin concentration increases, it makes these tight junctions more permeable, right? Preventing them 
from working properly, leading to leaky gut and leaky brain. So, um, so gluten um, basically impacts on the zonulin concentration, and then that basically affects you know the tight junctions, leading to leaky gut and leaky brain. Of course, inflammation is not completely bad. You know, it helps to bring protection and restoration to the body after illness, or injury, or trauma, or any stressful uh, situation. But if the stimulus that's triggering the inflammation persists, it just keeps on, you just keep on being exposed to these triggering factors, then, as I said, inflammation becomes chronic and harmful. Okay, so that's the situation you want to avoid. Acute inflammation, like acute stress, these are normal, normal processes, okay? They're there to help the body to help you to survive. But when they become chronic, ongoing, that's a real, really, really bad situation to be in. All right, so now just to basically sort of summarize it, what causes and contributes to NDD, neurodegenerative disease, and basically it's all the stresses. Your physical stresses, your psychological stresses, and your chemical stresses. And these include your oxidative stresses, a lot of free radicals floating around in the tissues and in your bloodstream. And these are things that stress the body out, okay? Stress the, the, your systems out, okay? So the fact is an overload of stressful toxins is actually the daily reality of most people today. Most people today are exposed to literally all toxins, either physical, chemical, and psychological, whether the thoughts, negative thinking is actually a toxin, it's toxic, okay? It's a really dangerous situation to be in when you're thinking negative thoughts all the time or negative beliefs, self-limiting, self-destructive beliefs. In fact, we spoke about beliefs uh, in episode one of the subconscious mind. So in, in essence, we are basically living in a sea of toxins, okay? <laughs> And uh, I think the key basically then is to try to minimize our exposure to these toxins if you want to maintain a reasonable level of health or if you want to optimize our health and wellness, then we need to basically make sure we're not exposed to them at all. Or if we are exposed to them, make sure you know we're getting rid of them and as they're coming into the body and mind, we get rid of them. So that's the challenge that, you know, of life today in terms when it comes to health and wellness. I just want to mention something about the exposome. Uh, the exposome is the measure of all the exposures of an individual uh, in a lifetime, right? And how these exposures relate to health. So they include, it includes like environmental factors, dietary factors, lifestyle factors, psychological factors, right? All the things we mentioned earlier on. So an individual's exposure actually begins before birth and includes insults from environmental and occupational sources. Um, and in fact, in newborn babies, studies were done on the umbilical cord blood. Um, and I think the figures 297 toxins on average were found in the umbilical cord blood of newborn babies. So, <laughs> so the mother's, obviously the mother's toxins get into the baby's blood, from the mother's blood into the baby's blood. And the baby is actually living in a toxic environment, internal environment, external environment, even before it's actually born. Okay, so the exposome describes how exposures from our environment, our diet, our lifestyle, etc., interact with our own unique characteristics, such as our genetics and our physiology, and then how this impacts on our health. Okay, now I just want to mention a study that was done, or that was actually published in um, Science Direct. And the question that this was asked is, are rises in electromagnetic field in the human environment interacting with multiple environmental pollutions, the tipping point for increases in neurological deaths in the Western world. And the abstract of the study, I'm gonna read this abstract, it says, based upon recent and new evidence, we hypothesize that a major contribution for the relative sudden upsurge in neurological morbidity in the Western world from 1989 to 2015 is because of increased background EMF that has become the tipping point impacting upon any genetic predisposition, increasing multiple interactive pollutants such as rises in petrochemicals, hormone disrupting chemicals, industrial, agricultural, and domestic chemicals. The unprecedented neurological death rates 
all within just 25 years, demand a re-examination of long-term EMF safety related to the increasing background EMF on human health. The authors say, we do not wish to stop the modern world, only make it safer. Now, you may be familiar, of course, with what's been happening in China and now the rest of the world. And it seems, in fact, that the catastrophe in Wuhan in China and other provinces in that country may actually be related to the widespread deployment of 5G technology, which basically interacted with the massive pollution in this country, which then this actually weakened the population's immune systems and made them basically extremely vulnerable to infection with the coronavirus. Uh, but other electromagnetic radiation technology like 4G and are also very destructive, of course, but it actually seems that 5G may be the most destructive, you know, uh, so far. So let's now have another closer look at the causes of, of MDD. Uh, we break them down into environmental, diet and lifestyle and so forth. So if you look at the environmental factors again, I'm going to just, I'm just going to basically list them like heavy metal to toxicity, aluminium, mercury, lead and so forth. Vaccines is a huge uh, environmental factor. Uh, infections, biotoxins, mold, mold are a very common cause actually of dementia, neurodegenerative disease, and which is not really that widely recognized. Parasites, Lyme infections and co-infections, electromagnetic fields, like we mentioned, physical trauma, traumatic brain injury, people playing sport, and so forth, organophosphates, bisphenol A, plasticizers, phthalates, medications, and petrochemicals. And if you come to, we look at the diet and lifestyle factors, lifestyle related factors, things like processed artificial foods. I mean, people are eating this on a massive scale across the world on a daily basis. Processed food, which is basically artificial foods, not really actually food. <laughs> the processed foods are actually not food. They, they, people think they've, it's food, but the, the body can't really handle it because it's not natural. So they cause massive problems. Heterocyclic amines, which is things you find when people barbecue or braai, as they say, meat. Food sensitivities or intolerances, allergies, microbiome imbalances, which we mentioned. Hormone imbalances, you know, insulin, diabetes, glycotoxins, when your sugar is not well controlled because of uh, dietary factors, um, then you, you end up with huge problems. Um, in fact, type 3 diabetes, Alzheimer's is known as type 3 diabetes because glucose is not pro properly processed in the brain. And so you get death of brain cells. And then nutrient deficiencies, okay? And then psychological factors, adverse childhood experiences, okay, that's a huge one. What, ex what, what, what actually happens to you as a child psychologically, uh, emotionally, uh, will impact on your health as you go through life in a negative way if those adverse childhood experiences are not resolved properly and timelessly, okay? Uh, also emotionally traumatic experiences beyond childhood, including life-threatening experiences, multiple life stresses, the divorce, death of a friend or family member, serious disease, accidents, and so forth, toxic beliefs and toxic thoughts, which we mentioned earlier on. Okay, so now I've mentioned inflammation before. So inflammation basically is the underlying factor in chronic disease, including chronic brain disease or MDD, neurodegenerative disease, okay? Um, it's a common underlying factor in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, many other chronic diseases and serious health problems, including brain dysfunction, shrinkage of the brain, and MDD, okay? Now, one of the main causes of neural inflammation is oxidative damage from free radicals. Okay, we mentioned oxidative stress. And this usually occurs secondary to brain toxicity from various toxins, whether it's fluoride, mercury, all these other things that we mentioned, okay? And in Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, you get a buildup of amyloid plaque between the brain cells, okay? And also damage from oxidative stress and glycation products, end products, uh, it's called ages, advanced glycation end products, have actually been linked to the buildup of this type of plaque, okay? Now, the microglia, which are basically immune cells in your brain, they prevent the formation of amyloid plaque in the brain, and they clean it up, actually. 
okay? So these immune cells called glial cells, and there's different types of them, they basically keep your neurons healthy. Uh, and they basically play a protective role. They're like nurse cells. They nurse the neurons. They keep them safe and healthy and look after them, okay? Um, but when the glial cells become damaged or become dysfunctional through various, uh, the various toxins, okay, that we mentioned, then the brain becomes dysfunctional and becomes increasingly susceptible to problems such as dementia and all these other conditions, cognitive decline, people can't remember, can't think properly, and so forth. Okay. Right, now... There's various ways that these toxins, uh, processes by which these toxins actually damage the brain, okay, and contribute to mental illnesses. And I'll mention them. Uh, they impair the immune system, they disrupt the gut microbiome, they increase the risk of diabetes and obesity, they damage the DNA, they impair enzyme systems, they impair detoxification processes, they alter gene expression, they damage cell membranes and cellular communication, they reduce cerebral blood flow, and they interfere with hormone production. So there's various ways that these toxins actually damage the brain, okay? Um, so I'm just going to mention some of these toxins in a little bit more detail, not much detail, but just mention them. There's many, many of these brain-destroying toxins. Um, we mentioned a few, but let's just go through some of them in a little bit more detail. So for example, aspartame, which is an artificial sweetener. It's not only neurotoxic, it doesn't only damage your brain, but it's actually carcinogenic too. It actually causes cancer. So, and you find these artificial sweeteners in a lot of these processed foods, okay? Um, and also people use them to sweeten your tea or your coffee or your drinks. Then there's heavy metals like mercury, lead, aluminium. These are significant factors associated with Alzheimer's and other dementias, Parkinson's and other brain diseases. Um, they found that aluminium accumulates in the region of the brain most prone to the biomarkers associated with Alzheimer's disease. So there's a link between aluminium and Alzheimer's. And they found that lead exposure early in life is also associated with dementia later in life. Okay. So uh, in fact, the two of the Western world's most popular foods have actually been implicated in immune-mediated brain damage. Uh, in fact, Green Med Info website, it says that a study was published in the Open Access Journal. The name of the German journal is Nutrients, and the title of the study was The Prevalence of Antibodies Against Wheat and Milk Proteins in Blood Donors and Their Contribution to Neuroimmune Reactivities. And it says that this study implicates two of the Western world's most popular foods in various forms of immune-mediated brain damage and dysfunction, including gluten ataxia and multiple sclerosis. So we said that the gut and the brain are connected. So the brain and central nervous system damage, spinal cord damage from gluten is obviously not surprising then, okay? And gluten can actually harm the brain without actually also producing GIT symptoms. So you may not have any gastrointestinal symptoms, but you can have brain damage just from eating wheat, okay? Um, there's a syndrome called hyperexcitable brain and refractory celiac disease, which, uh, which has been identified within the gluten-related disorder, disorders category of disorders, okay? So this is like a new type of syndrome that they discovered related to gluten. Uh, neuro, now, neurological dysfunction is one of the most common non-GIT manifestations of gluten-related disorders. And the neurological dysfunctions include, and symptoms include headaches, neuropathy, imbalance or cerebellar ataxia, memory loss, even seizures, epilepsy, psychosis, and other symptoms. And in fact, gluten ataxia is an autoimmune immune disease triggered by gluten, uh, where the immune system actually attacks the cerebellum, okay, that part of the brain may involve the balance and so forth. Um, in fact, there was a study which showed that uh, an, a study that a 75-year-old man, you know, presented with a one-year history of difficulty with walking, instability, and, and fatigability. And when the doctors examined his neurological system, his nervous system, they found that he had reduced facial expression, that 
okay, which is probably Parkinson's, bradykinesia, which is slow movement, slowness of movement and reflexes, so it's very rigid, muscular rigidity, and postural instability. And a brain scan was formed, you know, and uh, it revealed, you know, abnormalities which were consistent with low dopamine production, and in which, uh, in which combination with the clinical data led to this diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Now, what actually happened was after only three months of abstaining from gluten, the patient reported an almost complete remission of symptoms. You know? um, so his symptoms disappeared just from abstaining uh, from gluten. He stopped eating gluten and his Parkinson's symptoms disappeared. And now obviously in allopathic medicine, Western medicine, Many of these neurological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, are said to be, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, all of them are said to be irreversible. But this is actually not true. And at the end of this podcast, not this one, maybe at the end of part three, I'll describe a patient which I was treating for uh, Parkinson's. I made a dramatic uh, recovery and reversal of his condition. He didn't recover completely. But, I mean, it was chalk and cheese from the time I saw him to the time, you know, we, we went through the program, a three-month program. Um, and you can read the testimonial. I'll give you the link to the testimonial. Um, so these neuro neurological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, are in fact reversible. Um, but only if it's obviously treated in the right way in keeping with what the disease is all about and getting to the root causes of the of these diseases. All right. And after this patient, talking about this patient again, the 75-year-old patient that I just mentioned, who's when he stopped eating gluten, 18 months later when he was re-examined, he was actually found to actually have improved even further. So basically, stopping eating gluten actually reversed his condition, uh, which shows you that the importance of dietary factors in many diseases not only neurodegenerative disease. Now, co Cosmo protein, you know, has also been linked to over 50 adverse health effects. Um, although many, very few people consider, you know, Cosmo protein to be related to, as a, or a risk for immune-related neurological problems. So, uh, so in 2000, the study found that one key mechanism behind the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis actually is the production of cosmo known as butyrophilin. And this protein cross-reacts to myelin, oligo oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, which is a major component of the central nervous system. Okay, so in 2004, additionally, a study found patients with multiple sclerosis that highly significant elevations of IgA antibodies against another milk protein known as casein. Okay, so casein and butyrophilin, these proteins found in cow's milk causes a cross-reaction with a protein uh, in the nervous system. And this leads to degeneration of the myelin sheath, which causes then basically multiple sclerosis, okay? which is another neurodegenerative disease like we mentioned earlier on. Obviously, another toxin, which most people don't even realize is a toxin, is actually processed sugar, okay? <laughs> this is a very common toxin, actually. Uh, it sugars in everything. I mean, they put sugar in, in every, everything, really, today, processed sugar. So, frequently or, or persistently raised blood sugar levels actually dramatically increases the risk of impaired brain function and dementia. So if your blood sugar remains high all the time, then uh, you are at high risk of not only diabetes, uh, in fact, your blood sugar being up all the time is in fact diabetes, but if, it, if it's, uh, and that will lead to basically brain, brain dysfunction, brain impairment and dementia. So it's important, first of all, to prevent diabetes and also to breathe to to uh, you must keep your blood sugar levels you know in the optimal range the optimal range is said to be between 4.7 and 5 okay and your hemoglobin a1c which is a measure of your blood sugar control over a period of time you want to keep that between 5.3 and 5.4 okay 
And these levels are associated with preserving brain function. And I mentioned type 3 diabetes, which is basically uh, a failure of the brain to process glucose, take up glucose because of the fact that glucose, the diet has been, you know, leaky brain, you've got leaky gut, your diet is not optimal, eating too much processed carbs and so forth. And then the brain can't take up, the new the nerve cells can't take up glucose and they die off, you get dementia, okay? So sugar is a serious brain toxin, okay? Uh, it can actually kill you. So sugar, like other toxins, can actually kill you. And there's many other toxins. Alcohol is another common brain toxin. We're not going to talk about alcohol today, but uh, we know it's, alcohol is commonly consumed across the world and uh, definitely damages the brain. Microorganisms also can destroy the brain. You know, the bacteria, the viruses, the moles, like we mentioned earlier on. So, um, in fact, microbes can stimulate the formation of amyloid plaques in the brain, okay, as a means. Uh, and these plaques are actually a means to protect the brain against the microbes. And in fact, uh, certain viruses are actually found more commonly in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So when it comes to Alzheimer's, also a very important point is that one must treat Alzheimer's in the pre-symptomatic phase, that is before patients actually have symptoms uh, when plaques are actually detected. So um, this is the end of part one of this podcast, and we'll pick up the discussion in part two. So thanks for listening. Appreciate it.